So good evening, Santa Barbarians. So lovely to have you here and celebrating Fiesta in a very special way. Uh, if you've lived in Santa Barbara for any length of time, if you're here watching today, you know that Santa Barbara loves history. And we're going to talk about a most fascinating time period. The old Spanish days, which is basically the Rancho period, is one of the most, to me, fascinating periods in history but it's one that nobody really knows a whole lot about. And so we're gonna dive in today, uh, starting with just kind of a little background, um, looking at Fiesta itself, and then we'll go back into uh, ancient history for the uh, Rancho period. Uh, Santa Barbara, you know, loves history. Uh, we're always looking for ways to preserve our history, the old songs, the dances, the culture, the traditions. And this goes back even uh, say 1873 when we're building, just built a new little barrel theater, 19th century, and Santa Barbara celebrated it with dancers doing the old music and the old songs of the previous Rancho period. And we see that again in 1886 when we had the Mission Centennial and the old timers came out and said it's, you know, the end of, we're well into the American period, it's towards the end of the 19th century, but remember these good old songs and dances and they continue to do those in presentation to all the newcomers. And you know, even at the end, end of 19th century, uh, 1891, when President Benjamin Harrison came all the way out to Santa Barbara, they decorated the, uh, the State Street, red, white, and blue. But unlike most places out here in the far west, instead of saying, oh, those other days, those old days, you know, that's so beginning of the century, Instead, Santa Barbara then gave him, the, the president, a whole show and dance, literally, of the old traditions and the old traditional songs and dances of that rancho period. And then we see coming into the 20th century, from about 1900 to 1920, uh, the community tripled in size, but it still wanted to retain that history, even though we're all into the jazz age and you know World War I, then the jazz age, that during that time period, you had, we'll say like the De La Guerra sisters. Ah, there we go. There's the De La Guerra sisters, and they held a festival, I mean, their own little party, spring 1912. They brought out the old traditional Spanish food and had their friends doing the dances. And people from all over Santa Barbara going, what's that noise off of State Street? And they'd come over to Casa De La Guerra and see the ladies dressed up in their old costumes or the, the costumes of their parents, their grandparents, and enjoying these fiesta, old Spanish days, rancho period traditions. And then we go into 1920s and the community at that time was interested in restoring a number of different things. One, they had the community arts festival and they're looking to get a new theater, which was to repair and rebuild then the Libero Theater. And talking about making some kind of festival, the business community saying we ought to get some kind of, you know, something like Mardi Gras in New Orleans or the Rose Festival in Pasadena. And what they came up with was this idea to celebrate what was their history and traditions of a previous century. And they called it the Old Spanish Days Fiesta. And that is how our festival started. So your next question might be, well, when exactly, okay, that was 1924 was the first Old Spanish Days Fiesta, but what were the Old Spanish Days? Uh, when were the Old Spanish, when was this Rancho period? So we wanna look at a little nice timeline. So when were the Old Spanish Days? If you look at the top and you see that kind of pinkish beige, that's when we were under Spanish rule. So Spain came into California, 1769, uh, settling the Presidio down in San Diego. By the time we turn the century and go into 1812, you have the Mexican War of Independence. Mexico saw what was happening in, happening in the US. They liked the idea. They wanted to apply it to themselves in Spain, down in Mexico. But Mexico doesn't win and come to power until you see the green bar, 1822. Mexico comes to power. 1834 was the secularization of the missions, meaning they could no longer operate as missionary outpost outreach to the Indians. And then we know the Americans, we got the blue there, came in in 1846. And let's look at some other dates just to get yourself oriented. 
1848 was the gold rush, 1850, American statehood for California. 1863, the drought kills off the cattle. So kind of look, keep that one in mind. Now look over at the left and you see the old Spanish days in Santa Barbara kind of ran from the end of the 1820s. So Mexico's in power and comes all the way pretty much through until when the cattle are killed off. So our old Spanish days are actually under Mexican rule and largely under American rule. So you might wonder, well, then why do we call it old Spanish days? Why not Mexican days or old early American days? And the reason was, as we're going to go through this culture now and take a look at that, it's because the people retained the Spanish language for all that time. And then when you're going well into the American period, well into the 19th century and the turn of the century, the old timers would say, look around and see all the Yankees and how everything's changed and the city's built out. And they would say, gosh, remember those old days, the old Spanish days? And everybody knew they were referring to this special time, which we also sometimes call the Rancho period. If you've been a product of California elementary education, fourth grade, California history, you know, you're looking at the Rancho period. But you probably don't go into as much detail and fun as we will be going through today. So let's just quickly kind of run through what the setup is that got us there. And then we'll get into all the juicy details of the Rancho period, the old Spanish days. Okay, we have this time period where Spain is in control. You remember our, we'll go back there a second, Spain's in control. Spain comes to Santa Barbara and builds the Presidio in 1782 and the mission in 1786. You don't have to memorize that, just get yourself oriented. Okay, Spain comes here and they are basically the world superpower and they're out busy all over the uh, all over the world including uh, the new world and here we have uh, what the most of the United States looks like and just to kind of give you again a little kind of orientation you see Mexico at the bottom you recognize Baja and if you grow up in Keller in you know just any American school you tend to think of everything in the United States is coming from Britain and maybe some stuff with, with French, but with France. But here you can see uh, New Mexico and Texas and how much is going through the United States. That's look at see Salt Lake City up at the top there. And you see California, uh, Nuevo California, Alta California. And this is all under the Spanish dominion, dominion. So we look up here at over to the left and you see the little cutout at the top and that's San Francisco Bay. So you can see far, how far north Spain was in control of different lands, supposedly in control of different lands in uh, the later United States. Okay, the four dots represent the four original presidios. So what Spain wants to do, if you look down below and you see where Mexico is, Durango, et cetera, et cetera, um, they, that's pretty much where their center of power is and where they're operating in all the new world, but the, the big brouhaha is in Mexico. And they want to protect Mexico from foreign foreigners, foreign incursions from the French or the Russians or anybody else that might be trying to come in and take over Mexico. So Spain puts the four presidios, garrisons, okay, uh, to protect their lands from people sneaking in along the coast and trying to take over Mexico. So the four dots represent at the top San Francisco, then Monterey, Santa Barbara, and San Diego. Uh, Santa Barbara was the last to be put in, started at the bottom, San Diego, San Francisco, Monterey, then uh, finished with Santa Barbara. And the next part is that they are going to allow missions from the Franciscan priests to come in to make citizens of, this, uh, of the Indians, the native people that were here, so that they would be the workers, they would be tax paying citizens. So this was kind of the very, very broad, big picture that we have in mind here. And when you send the soldiers out here to the Presidios and then to start working there, they're going to need supplies. And so the supply ships from Mexico need to come up and give the supplies, tools, household stuff, et cetera, et cetera, for the people living in California because California, as much as we think of it as the golden land today, is very, very deserted and uh, just a wilderness, it's chaparral, it's, it didn't have hotels and palm trees yet. <laughs> so, so far so good. Oh wait, let's take a look. There's our California missions. 
and you see somewhere halfway in between, you'll see Santa Barbara, but you see they were very busy to do this, the entire collection of the 21 missions. Now in 1812, there's political chaos in Europe and Mexico. First of all, Spain's fighting everything that's going on in Europe. And now remember, Mexico's fighting for independence. So because this is really kind of using up all of the time and energy of Spain, they're not taking the time and energy to get those ships and supplies up to Alta California to take care of the presidios and the missions up there. Also, remember that Spain doesn't want to have these foreign, the foreigners coming in, the French and the British and the, and the Russians. So they say trading is forbidden. You can't trade with any foreign ships. It's got to clear us, you know, down here and then we're going to allow you to do it. But you know, trading not only is forbidden, but basically it's the only way these people are going to survive in Alta California. So necessity is the mother of smuggling. So trading ships would come in and with a little wink and a nod, they trade with everybody, including the missions. And what are they trading? Well, the guys from the outside coming in are bringing in supplies. They're going to bring in furniture. They're bringing in just basically everything that you need, basic necessities. And meanwhile, in Alta California, what they are dealing with is what, uh, what they're going to supply is what these ships are looking for, which is furs and hides and even tallow from the cattle. So the missions have been raising cattle. And now when the ships come in, they bring the hides to bring back to Boston or to bring back to Europe. And the ships are going to use the hides to build all kinds. We'll get into that in a little more detail. And uh, this is what they're doing, trading in order to get their everyday supplies that they need. And meanwhile, the trading ships are very excited to get furs and tallow and especially the hides. Now, you might remember 1822, we said Mexico wins independence. When Mexico wins independence, it allowed trading. Spanish was kicked out, all the Spaniards. And then the missions were secularized in 1834. And to award the faithful people that were, you know, that were standing behind Mexico and to protect Mexico from any insurgents, this land, including the mission lands, were given out as grants by the Mexican government. These were rancho land grants, and as people call it, it was a land grab. So in our area, let's take a look at some more fun stuff. Okay, here's California under Mexico, 1822. This beautiful painting, of course, is in the mural room at our Santa Barbara courthouse. So one of the interesting little sidelines here is how much this time period and history is so beloved in Santa Barbara that we see it all over our public art. And in the, this case, the public art is individuals. It wasn't like a commission bringing it in. It was just individuals saying, gosh, this is how we want things to happen. Here's our courthouse. But in Santa Barbara, they go, we're not going to have white walls. We're going to tell our history. And they brought in these people to paint these fantastic murals, in this case, and, um, and telling the story of our history. One more shot. Here is our Mexico land grants. There's the black represents these large rancho land grants that were given out to the faithful, so to speak, uh, people supporting Mexico and its fight for independence. If we look out in Santa Barbara, you'll notice that even the islands were land grants. And of course, everything along the coast very much becoming land grants. So this ushers in our period of Mexican land grants leading to the Rancho period and ushering in what we are going to be referring later to as the old Spanish days. Let's look at a couple other of these land grants. Here is Santa Barbara County. Now, if you look at the bottom, all the way at the bottom towards the right, that's actually where we know the city of Santa Barbara is. All the rest of those different colors represent the different original land grants. So you can see Rancho Lompoc and you can see uh, Rancho, de, um, de, uh, <laughs> Rancho Julian, there's San Julian. And uh, probably the rest is very too small to read, but all of those are the original land grants and you can see they're quite large. So this takes us right into our old Spanish days. Uh, this is a painting by Alexander Harmer, probably the first great California artist. He was based in Santa Barbara. In fact, City Hall, 
that area just about there, the city hall parking lot was uh, an adobe and his, uh, the Alexander Harmer's wife's family lived in that adobe and that became his studio and his home. So just catty corner to Casa de la Guerra. And here we have a picture featuring, a painting featuring what would have been a common game that would have been taken place during the old Spanish days. So the Rancho period, our old Spanish days, is basically distinguished by these elements. Being a writer, I couldn't help myself, so it had to be <laughs> alliteration. So they are distinguished by hides, horses, hospitality, haciendas, the wedding, we'll talk about, and the jota. So let's break this down and let's take a look at all of this fun stuff. Okay, first of all, hides. So we know that these great herds of cattle were being run by the missions and they were raised by the missions for food, a trade for food and furnishings. Uh, this particular mural that represents here was a tile mural and you know this is now over by Public Market on Chapala Street. And anyway, and then just a great another example of public art. The, um, the mission fathers took their their training and the way that they raised the cattle from the Iberian Peninsula and they trained basically the Chumash to be taking care of the herds and so therefore our first cowboys, our first vaqueros, were actually our Chumash Indian, the native people. Now vaqueros comes from the Spanish word for cow, vaca, right? So vaqueros. Just to let you know that when the Americans show up, you know how they just completely ruin the pronunciation of everything. So they wouldn't say, as the Spanish traditional classic pronunciation, Castilian wouldn't say vaca, they'd say vaca, the vaqueros. So then when the Americans came along and mispronounced everything, they would say buckaroo, and that's where we get the name buckaroo or cowboys. So if you're raising the hides, oh wait, let's take a look at a buckaroo right there, a vaquero. And if this doesn't look familiar to you, this is a fantastic piece. And this is in our train station. There's a long story to this. So you can read about it in the book, but um, this looks like a bas relief of metal, but it's actually uh, plaster covered with a special, uh, uh, special finish, I'm <laughs> blanking on the word. So when we're raising the hides, you'd say, now how are they gonna use the hides? Exactly what they do at that time, how are they being used? And the hides would be used for clothes, Okay, belts, shoes, baggage. Now in California, even building material, interestingly enough, um, the hides were considered the, the California greenback. And at this time, you have those four presidios. Uh, the presidios now are just still buildings. You've got the missions, you've got people coming into these little areas, but you don't have full on towns. You don't have uh, stores. You don't have banks, there is no currency. There's just the population raising the cattle. Either they're working on the missions up until secularization or they're on the ranchos. They're raising the cattle, waiting for these trading ships to come in. And the currency is this hide that weighs 60 pounds that's <laughs> um, off of the steer. And um, also I could say that these steer were probably the closest thing to our local home improvement because the strips of leather, the thongs you could use to tie things together and to build, they were kind of the nails of the time. Hides were also used, as I said, for building material in the sense that they might serve as a door or shutters, strung across little pieces of wood, you'd make your bed and your chair from all of this. So cattle was king, as we say, and it's pretty much the only thing. There are not any other industries. And when the ships came in to trade, they would be mazed. They'd come in from Boston, for instance, and they would have on board maybe some clothes, material, some shoes, and they would be astounded that they are trading with the locals who have the raw material of leather, and the locals are not making their own shoes. Instead, they're just selling this, <laughs> the raw material, and now they're paying through the nose to get their shoes that were made from the leather in Boston, put on the ship and come back. All right. What else do we have? We also have um, the tallow, which is the fat that comes from that, and that's you know rendered down. And um, that might be used for candles before you have the electric light bulbs. It was used in soap, 
dressing for leather. Uh, the hides might go for $2 a piece as much as maybe five to $6 a piece at the height of one, you know, they're paying the most for it. You would use them for saddles and harness, shoes and boots and leather jackets. Now, in order to keep track, by the way, of all of your cattle, as you remember, we don't have a whole lot of supplies here. And these land grants were, by the way, from 4,000 to 48,000 acres. So you can do the math on this, connect the dots, and imagine even if you only had 4,000 acres, the idea of building a fence around your property is pretty horrible. Uh, not only maybe impossible because of lack of wood, materials, hammers, saws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So cattle brands were cheaper and faster than fences. Here you see Miguel Cordero. If you kind of look sideways, there's an M. There's a C at the bottom. So he's using his initials, and he will brand his cattle. And uh, later on, when they are doing a roundup, we'll get a little bit more into that later. But um, the way that you're going to keep track of who owns what cattle is because of the cattle brand. So when the cattle are out on the fields and you have this large acreage, it's possible that they're going to run into somebody else's property without any fences. But when the cowboys come out to do the annual roundup, they can separate the cattle according to these uh, uh, brands. And let's see, last we have the ships that will come in. The ships that are trading ships, merchant ships coming in, are a great deal of them come in from Boston because Boston is where they're going to, you know, take all the leather and to manufacture it into different things. But you also have plenty of ships that are coming from other parts of the world, including Europe. But we'll pick on the Boston Clipper ships for now. Um, they traveled for about 200 days, 17,000 miles to 18,000 miles, going around Cape Horn and then to bring up the, the goods and the merchandises up California, uh, up past Mexico and to California. When Spain, at the end of when Spain was coming, it was about two to three, maybe four ships a year. And then under Mexico, there was about 25 ships a year. So these were regular occurrences and people knew how to prepare for them. So there was quite a difference between getting your deliveries from the postal, U.S. Postal and FedEx was the difference between getting them from Spain and now under the other rule that we can get all these ships coming in regularly. And here is a wonderful illustration from the book, uh, Richard Henry Dana, two years before the mast. And he is a young uh, attorney, or actually he's a law student. He joins one of the merchant ships in Boston the Clipper ships and comes out to California. The first place they come to is Santa Barbara. And what you're seeing here are the sailors from the American sailors. They've gone ashore. They're picking up these hides that you can see here are folded in half. The guy's carrying it on his head. They are stiff now. So it's like a gigantic piece of cardboard and it probably weighs 40 to 60 pounds. And they're gonna load it up into the little rowboat that's awaiting them. And then that man's gonna row out to the ship and then they will load it from there into the ship. So there's for our hides. But what else constitutes part of our distinguishing time period is horses. This is a painting of uh, supposedly of Dwight Murphy on his golden palomino, which he had developed. And you might notice in the background the mission but off the tail of the horse and and the front legs of the horse, you will see the new Libero Theater that's just being made. And this hangs in the courthouse when you're coming in off of the Figueroa Street. And I'm sorry, Anna Kappa Street across from the library. You will just keep walking to that wall and I believe that's where he's at. All right. When you are living on these large tracts of land, these gigantic uh, ranches, you don't have any cars, of course, and you don't even have any carriages. There's no roads during this time period. It's just the chaparral and the people on their horses. So if you are on a horse all day long, you get to be pretty good at it. And the style that they had uh, to guide the horse was not like the Americans who would have a rein and pull in and control the horse kind of through the rein for the most part. For the Spaniards or the Mexicans or the Californians, at this time, it was more like dressage. So a wave of your hand, the press of your right knee is what tells that horse to giddy up, stop, go, turn to the right. 
but the horsemen were considered absolutely phenomenal in California. And people described them as uh, better than the Arabians, better than the Tatars of Mongolia, that these were all expert riders, women included, and children, um, just tons and tons of horses all over the place. And so your question is, well, just why were they so expert? Again, size of the land that you're traveling on, there are no finished roads, there's no bridges, there's miles to go to your neighbor, the next ranch, if you wanted to borrow a cup of sugar, the wife would jump on the horse <laughs> and travel for 40 minutes before she got to the end of the property. You're also dodging gopher holes, wild animals, bobcats, coyotes, and the people coming out to contemporary people, traveling visitors coming to California at this time would describe the saying, you ought to see the woman here how they go flying on their horse, jumping over these bushes. I mean, there was nothing even to compare with this, you know, back on the East Coast. And by the way, when people rode, they only had two speeds. They were just going a little bit, just down the road a bit, well, path a bit, um, or fast. There was no medium road. It was just wash out there. So they said that the kids often could ride a horse before they could walk. I think that's one of those California high <laughs> tall tales. But nonetheless, um, they were expert. And they would also joke about the Californians being so in love with their horse that they would be lazy about it. They would ride their horse to the end of a block in town when they started building out the city rather than <laughs> just walking it. No, they're gonna hop on their horse and then you know go one block once they got into the American style. So here's another beautiful painting. This one you can see in the El Paseo. This was, uh, I forgot the guy's, the guy's name right now, but I think we might see more of his work a little bit later. Um, just beautiful, beautiful work. Here, this looks a little more like the, perhaps the Mexican than simply California style, judging by the clothes there. You might see the hat with the, with the pointed, um, the, the broad, wide brim with the pointed part in the uh, house, part of the hat. And that's more the Mexican style as opposed to Spanish California, the Rancho period in California, but we'll see more examples of that. And the other thing that shows off their expertise, oh, here's another great one. This is Paradise Cafe. If anybody has an old, old photo of this that has more detail, I would love to see that, get a hold of me. We would love to have this whole painting mural outside restored. And here's something else that the Californians did. Here you see the more traditional Spanish California, Spanish Rancho period um, clothes here with the uh, shorter brim and flat on top. And what they're doing is they are trying to grab a grizzly or a black bear. And they would do this just for the show off their expertise that they could even do this. If you look carefully, you see the expressions on the horse's face looks like, I'd like to get out of here. But the cowboys here, the vaqueros, would like to show off their skill and how good they are and what control they have of their horses in order to you know, swing up, grab the horse, and move on. And one more that shows this is a famous one called the chicken pole. This was also done by Alexander Harmer. And here you see the crowd of Santa Barbara in their traditional clothes at that time on the beach right here in Santa Barbara, watching the skill of the equestrians. Now, in recent times, when you find this online, you just see this left side of it, maybe for political correctness, because what they will do is they will take sometimes a gold coin, but more fun would be to take a live chicken, bury it just loosely in the sand up to its neck. And what the horseman is gonna do, the equestrian is gonna get on the horse, they're all gonna line up, all the young men, and then ride full speed ahead, one by one, and see if they can stay on top of their horse, bend all the way over, grab the chicken, pluck it out basically of the sand, it's just loosely in the sand, and then to the great admiration of all the crowd. Or they might miss entirely, or they might fall off the horse. But let's take a look at the rest of this. Here you can see the rider in the middle, you can see that he's bending way over, you can see that the chicken is just very loosely in the sand, and he's trying to show off that he's gonna be able to grab the chicken and here is the full picture of this. Again, Alexander Harmer. Next, we wanna talk about the hospitality of the uh, Californios. And by the way, they did not refer to themselves as Spaniards. 
unless they were born in Spain. Most of the people came by way of Mexico. They came from Spain to Mexico, been there several generations. Now they're in California for several generations. They do not refer to themselves as Mexican. They do not refer to themselves as Spaniards. They are Californians, Californians. And if you think about this time period, it's so unusual that they really didn't have much in the way of government. Now, when Mexico was in control and came in, uh, to power in 1822, they were busy down in Mexico. They weren't doing a whole lot here in, up in Alta California. So there wasn't really any government. The government didn't build any roads. They didn't build any, under Mexico, they didn't build any bridges. Nothing was happening. So everybody's just taking care of themselves. There's no towns. The only towns, such as they were, were the four presidios and the other um, settlements that came um, soon after that period, Los Angeles, uh, San Jose, Santa Clara. So around the missions, but you didn't have these individual towns, you didn't have stores, etc. So what happens if a man comes through, maybe he's visiting from Europe and just checking out California, he might be from part of the United States, he might be even be from Mexico working himself up, and he's traveling on his horse and he doesn't know where in the heck he's gonna go here. He sees another vaquero and says, you know, where can I hang my hat here? The vaquero will say, come follow me. And they will go to the ranchero's hacienda, his house, and the man in charge there, the ranchero will say, welcome stranger, my house is your house, mi casa es su casa. That's where that expression comes from. There's no hotels, no inns, but there's, there's no currency. A man would probably travel with gold and you might be trading the gold, but there isn't per se a monetary system. This man will put up the visitor and then uh, everybody would just get along. He'd make a party out of the fact that the man was there and say, hey, there's a stranger here, let's have a party. Um, he would tell his vaqueros, bring out the neighboring ranchers to come here. We're gonna have a real great time um, hearing about the news from America or Mexico, or maybe the guys just from Northern California and we're Southern California. Strangers were treated so kindly that they talked about in all the visitors, the incredible hospitality of the Californians and the fact that they were strangers. And then because they were there, there would be a party thrown kind of in their honor and kind of as an excuse for all the rancheros to get together and come from the miles to find out what's happening with everybody else. So at this time, it, they described it themselves how everybody got along. The local Indian native people, Santa Barbara, that would be the Chumash, the Spanish, the Mexican, the Californian, everybody just kind of took care of one another. They said poverty was sort of unknown. Well, it wasn't that anybody had a lot of money, it's just that if you were impoverished and you didn't have a big fancy rancho, people just took care of you. You know, you didn't have money because we didn't have banks, you did just take care of you. And hunger was unknown, and it's described as being very idealistic. Look at those halcyon days, Spanish Arcadia, Dolce Farniente, the sweetness for nothing. But the people at that time described it the same way. It wasn't just a Hollywood creation after the fact. Um, wash day, by the way, was another reason to have a party. And people would basically be getting together to go to the hot springs. Let's take some look at some other fun stuff here. Wait a second. Uh, this is, by the way, you've seen this a million times and never seen it this fantastic detail. This is in the Granada Theater, and it's above, straight center above the proscenium. And we see here people doing the traditional dances with the gentlemen accompanying them on guitar and tambourine, the ladies dancing with their fans. And let's go to wash day. This uh, particular mural was done, it's in the Bank of America on... Uh, Canon Perdido and State. It was originally down in Beverly Hills. Uh, the, uh, the, wasn't the Bank of America, so the, um, I can't remember the name right now. The, uh, come to me, but it was down in Beverly Hills. So you notice here that there's a lot of people, they're packing up the oxen cart. They're gonna go out where the hot springs are to do their laundry. They're gonna use that as a reason to have a little fiesta and they'll have music and celebrate and eat. And they bring the Indians with them who worked as domestics at this time on the ranchos. 
Here you see the Indians don't look like the Chumash. Their dress is different because this is Beverly Hills area. This was Rancho um, Aguas Caliente. And so they're doing the heavy lifting. So they're doing the harder work. You know, the ladies are fanning themselves and saying yeah, that looks clean enough. But that was how they ran their lives at that time. Um, also, as I mentioned, that this was still the local people speaking Spanish into the American period. When America comes to power, of course, you're going to have your court records need to be in English. But because English was not spoken, even begin to be as widely spoken as the Spanish here, they actually went back to Spanish being the language of record in our American courthouse, courtrooms here, until 1870, and then it went back permanently to English. So just kind of an interesting thing there. And we also see here, again, the hospitality and the music. Californians were famous for just being natural musicians. It said every house seemed like it had a guitar and people knew how to play it. And this, we've got a couple of interesting features. This was also in the Bank of America on state. Just go in there, there's fabulous paintings there. Um, notice how the man is dressed. So he's got uh, the fancy shirt, he's dressed formally, in he's got a scarf around his head, but notice in front of him, he has that Spanish uh, California style hat where it's flat on the top and it's in the short brim. And our senorita is dressed all very fancy with the mantilla. Between them, look above and you see a man and a woman on a horse. And this is the Spanish California style of riding. The girl does not ride behind the guy, she rides in front of him. And again, he doesn't have to have a tight control of the horse through the reins. He's doing it, you know, more dressage. So he's kind of um, holding on to the woman and helping her. And you notice here, he looks like he's quite, um, He's abreast of the whole situation. And in front of them, if you watch her gaze and right in front of her, look like they're two priests and they're checking him out and saying, we will see you in the confession tomorrow, sir, senor. And then on behind them, you see the house that kind of looks like what sometimes they call the Monterey style. And uh, my brother Neil likes to point out that no, that style started here first with the Massini Adobe. But nonetheless, this would be a very picturesque view of Spanish as California, Rancho period, and the gentlemen going outside the women's uh, homes and singing with their friends with the guitar to get their attention. And maybe they'll come to the window or maybe they will come outside and be further wooed. So here we have one other aspect, another aspect of the old Spanish days which is our hacienda. And here we have the style of the houses made out of adobe. Um, here is a little quote I wanna give you, have to do with uh, someone who came to look at California during this time period. And this is from Richard Henry Dana, two years before the mast. And he's describing how people are dressed in California. Very few of the men have adapted our mode of dress the greater part, actually, let's take a look back there. Um, the greater part adhering to the ancient costume of the paint of the past century. Um, short pants and jackets trimmed with scarlet. And here it's, you see, actually, he's got gold braid. Um, a sash about the waist. Botas of ornamental and embroidered deer skin. Secured by colored garters. Embroidered shoes. The hair long braided. This is the men, by the way. <laughs> and fastened behind with the ribbon a black silk handkerchief around the head. This gentleman here happens to have um, a red. You see the gentleman on the horse up in front of him has a green scarf, but this just happened to be how uh, Richard Henry Dana noted it. Surmounted by an oval and broad brimmed hat is the dress universally worn by the men of California. So back to the houses. Um, the grand house would have been the Casa de la Guerra, so the de la Guerra's house on de la Guerra Street. And let's take a look at that. This, by the way, is at the Adobes at our wonderful Santa Barbara Historical Museum. And the greater families would have a U-shaped house, but the others have you seen throughout Santa Barbara would have just been a rectangle, just a square. And just a nice picture inside here of the de la Guerra house, some of those pieces, the uh, the old, uh, I want to say spinet, but the, the, the 
pre-piano piano is actually here on display at the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. We tend to think of that house as being so primitive and it was considered the fantastic house of California. Here we're looking at it in the late 19th century and you can see they put in a wooden floor by then and it's quite civilized with these beautiful paintings and the furnishings that they probably would have been trading over the years earlier on with those trading ships. Here's another one shot and this is in the window and that's that guitar played by Francesca de la Guerra is actually also in the collection here at the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. And this painting was done, as you see at the bottom right corner, Alexander Harmer. So he came here from the East Coast. He would have lived catty corner to this actual window. And if you're looking out this window, you're looking out at kind of the corner of De La Guerra and State Street. And that's a wonderful, wonderful painting. And going right into that, we will, our last two are number one is the wedding. And this wedding was of the daughter of Mr. De La Guerra, the, uh, El Capitan, so the distinguished, most important probably resident of Santa Barbara. And she's going to marry one of the representatives, the agent for one of those Boston trading ship companies that comes out here. He had an office in California and he had a little office actually by then in Santa Barbara. And when they got married, they were, this wedding was attended by Richard Henry Dana. And he writes about it in his book. And it's just a fantastic description of all the different customs there. One of which was the cascaroni, which at that time was an egg that they hollowed out and filled with perfume, maybe little pieces of glitter paper. You, uh, the woman would use it typically, the young woman, to put on uh, a young man that they fancy, they'd crack it over their head and sort of mark them <laughs> with their perfume, their cologne. We know them today, of course, as just the confetti eggs. The other thing he remarked about, wait, first let's take a look. There's Mr. De La Guerra, a fantastic bar relief that you see in where 1129 State Street is. Go into that courtyard there and you see many famous historical figures around there. And here is Casa De La Guerra, which is a grand house. It's U-shaped, so you can imagine you're on De La Guerra Street and looking straight forward. And uh, the man who is sitting in the chair at the, the young man, would it be Richard Henry Dana? Uh, then you see the lady with the fan, and the person next to that would be um, Captain De La Guerra. And next to him is Father Sarah, who was not there. He was long dead by then, but nonetheless, that captured the imagination <laughs> for the artist to put him in there. And you see the couple dancing and the people coming through Santa Barbara and all of California talked about how fantastic the Californians were. They loved dancing and that these people, men, 74 years old, would dance like a man half their age. So very, very impressive. Very, very impressive. If you are at City Hall and you're looking across the street to El Paseo and you walk across the street and you go down that corridor, uh, the street of Spain, you will see this beautiful tile work and it says in commemoration of the visit of the ship alert to Santa Barbara, January 1836, at which time Richard Henry Dana was entertained in this house for the wedding as described in two years before the mast. For those of you who are going, wait, I thought his ship was the Pilgrim. He came over on the Pilgrim and then after they, it takes them several months, six to eight months, maybe even a year to collect going up and down the coast to fill the ship with the hides before they go back. He was ready to go back and they could use a hand. So he jumped off, you know, remaining with Pilgrim and then going to alert and going back. So our last one is the Hota. And this goes back to tributing our love of dancing to California and especially in Santa Barbara. Now, as you're looking at this, this should be familiar to all of you Santa Barbarians. You've all seen this a million times but not in this much detail. This is a mural done of the traditional dances of Spain and Mexico as you're entering the Arlington Theater. So as you're going underneath the arcade and just before you walk through the doors, you look up and then you'll see this wonderful uh, painting. The lady here in the yellow dress, just by the way, that's um, Geraldine Sayun. 
And uh, those of you who are involved with the ge uh, Genealogical Society know that the Sa that was the Sayun, her husband's laboratory. But she, she was a descendiente and she studied dance with a very famous local lady, um, Marie de Los Angeles Ruiz. And here she is actually dancing the Hota. So the Hota was a dance, it actually means little flea because the people were jumping up and down and dancing very quick, fast steps. And it was the favorite dance. So the correspondent said that it's favorite dance of the Santa Barbarans. So they loved to dance as I described, they were very nimble of foot. By the way, when they had a party, a fiesta, this wasn't like, oh, they danced hardy and ate up and then went home. These parties lasted for days. If you had a wedding, it lasted for two or three days. It could last as long as a week. Everybody just took off. They didn't have a nine to five job. Uh, they'd all come in and camp out at the house and have a great barbecue in the backyard and then dance the night away. So here we have Casa de la Guerra and uh, states, I'm sorry, uh, De La Guerra Street would be to our far right off camera. You see the dancers here, and I want you to look in the lower right hand corner. Musicians in these kind of grand parties would all be gathered in one corner. And usually as you're looking into that U shape, they'd usually be in one of those, either usually to the left, but sometimes to the right. And benches would be placed along the sides and everybody would be dancing. Uh, they would have what they called kind of like an MC for these dances. And he would announce what the dance was to the musicians. They would play that song. And then this man would then go to one of the single women and say, can I have this dance? And in this manner, all the single women or widowed, you know, would have somebody to dance with and he would be starring them because he would lead off the dance. Um, the men, the woman would be sitting on the benches as you hear, see here. The men, remember, love these horses so much that they are actually at the opening of that U-shape on their horses. So that's, <laughs> that's gonna be their chair. And if they see a babe they wanna dance with, well, they hop off the horse, they take off their spurs, put it across the saddle, go off, ask the lady to dance, then get back on their horse and then wait, you know, juggle around for position with the horses to check out the babes. But again, we have the famous wedding here with the, Anita de la Guerra marrying Alfred Robinson, an agent for the um, Hides and Tallow Company, having this fabulous everybody coming to the de la Guerra house for the wedding and people remarking on their stamina and their fantastic footwork. Here we see the rest of that thing that we just saw a few, a uh, few shots ago. You saw the one half and now you're seeing the left side and there's again our musicians in that U shape. And here's one more picture that's on the Arlington and we see this man on the right. I mean, he's the only man there. And that is Juan Cota. And his family has been dancing here. The Cota family goes all the way back to the Presidio. His daughter, Kathy Cota, has been a dance teacher here for gosh, 50 plus years, 60 years. Um, his daughters all danced, um, his granddaughters danced. Uh, his granddaughter was um, Paula Lopez, who was also a dancer. It goes on and on and on. So there's been, gosh, since the 19th century into now the 21st century, always been CODA's dancing at our fiesta. Which brings us to our conclusion. Now that we have a little more understanding of our old Spanish days, the Rancho period, this takes us to the 20th century modern era of how we celebrate fiesta today. Hospitality, that's represented by the spirit of Fiesta, who's a girl who's chosen for her charm, her spectacular dancing, and that she's gonna represent the spirit of this party to the rest of the community and our visitors. And the flower girls represent that hospitality. And the Sp old Spanish days, La Jota, a tradition of songs and dances unique to California has been preserved through the 20th century and even through the 21st century through different fiesta events. Uh, this represents, for you people who've been here a long time, they used to have the children's strolling chorus that sang the old songs. And more contemporarily, we've had the um, Flori Canto, a show Friday nights at the mission, I'm sorry, at the courthouse. Um, I narrate the history. We have uh, um, my husband, Jim Garcia, and a number of wonderful musicians who play the original music done at that time and other featured dancers dancing the dances that they would have done during that era. So you're learning 
what it would have looked like to come back to a party back in the uh, 18, we say we do in the greatest hits of 1836. And also we living the tradition and the era of all that would be including the horses. Uh, our rodeo is one of the largest and certainly the best rodeos in the country. And our equestrian parade is, our parade with so many horses is the largest regular annual uh, horse equestrian parade. And we finish now with Old Spanish Days, as Stacia mentioned. Thank you. This, uh, if you want to hear, want to find out more information, in more detail, and see more of the public art, um, this book is available locally. And I want to thank the Santa Barbara Historical Museum for putting this on and making history available to everybody at their homes. I especially want to thank uh, Mason Matthews, who is our guru here to making all this happen and our deputy um, director at this time, Dacia Harwood, who's just been a whiz bang and making all these things happen.